Welcome to Ruby on Rails. We're going to build a demo blog to demonstrate how to get started with the framework, build something real, and then deploy to production. Let's go. We're going to start with the creation of the Rails skeleton. This includes all the default directories and some stock files for you to fill in with all your content. And it also sets up all the dependencies that the Rails framework uses by default. Now that we have this skeleton, we can start by generating the first model for our blog, a post model that's going to have a string as a title and a text field as content. We're using this generator to create the files needed for the controller, for the post model, for the views, for everything. Let's have a look at what's been created. The first thing we're going to have a look at is the migration. The migration is what sets up the database table. And as you can see here, we designated that we want a string title and a text content. And then by default, Rails also adds a set of timestamps for created at and updated at. This is then connected to the post model that will instantiate and encapsulate these database rows which again is invoked by the posts controller. It has all the actions needed to encapsulate a REST style approach to developing web applications. You have the seven default actions. Um, and a handful of these actions then have templates like index, show, new, and edit. Uh, I could show you one of those. And that is basically all we need to get started with the most basic uh, outline of a web application. So we will run the migration as the first thing to set up the database and set up the post table. And then we can have a look at that schema that's been generated for us. As you can see now, it just has the post table in there. Let's have a look at how that looks in the browser. So we start the Rails server, and then we jump over to the browser. And as you can see here, it just gives us a nice boot screen that shows the version of Rails that we're using and the version of Ruby. But our new app that we created with the scaffold lives under slash posts. It is the basic CRUD app. Hello world. We create a new post. Um, first post. And when we post that, it'll go to the create action, which will redirect to the show action. And then we can go back to the index action. I've done this demo a bunch of times before, and it's always looked like this. It's not very nice. So for this demo, I'm going to pop in the simple CSS framework um, straight off the CDN so that we can have something slightly nicer to look at. And I'll do that by going to the default um, layout that all the uh, views are rendered within. And I'm just going to pop in the symbol CSS uh, styles. And then let's have a look if that doesn't look a little better. It sure does. Okay, so now we have the CRUD actions, uh, not just for HTML, but actually also for a JSON API. If I do dot JSON behind the post here, you'll see the entire collection currently consisting just of one element returned as JSON that you could hook up to a single page application, expose as a public API, whatever you want. If we jump back and take a quick look here at the controller, you can see that this is all mapped up. And for these actions that create an update, we have different paths, whether you are submitting from HTML or whether you're submitting from JSON. Okay, let's actually start developing our domain model. So the first thing we could do is we could add validations to the post. We could say validates presence of title. And now if we go to attempt to make a new post that has no title, we will get an error that simply says this can't be saved because the title can't be blank. That error is generated by the um, the form um, HTML that we have the template here we have under app views posts form, 
can see if there are any errors, it'll show all these errors first. And you can trace that all the way through from the create. Um, as we go through the create action, we try first to save if that is successful, then find the post is created and re redirect. If it's not successful, we will render the new action again as an unprocessable entity with those error messages in there. That is a user error, if you will. We can also make a programmer error here and see what that looks like if we reference the wrong variable and then try to load it. We can see we get this uh, error screen in development that shows the exception being raised and the backtrace where it's um, coming from. And then we actually also have a console built right into the error screen that lets you manipulate and look at all the variables that have been assigned in there. Now, that console is also accessible um, from the command line. We can jump in and start a brand new console here and interact with the main model that we've been building up. If we go to post, post first, it'll fetch the first post that we created. This was the one we created through the web interface, but we can create a, another one through this uh, console as well. If we do title from the console, content, Nice. We'll see you start a transaction, insert into the post table, and there we have it, another post object. We can also create these objects. For example, just post all will get us everything. If we want to find just some of it, we can, for example, query on created at. We could do time, now, uh, all day. That'll create a range for the entire day. We'll see we find still the same two posts. You can see what that SQL statement actually looks like in total. We can try one where we don't find anything. Time now, yesterday, didn't have anything posted then. That's the uh, SQL for it. And this is the empty array that's returning back. Okay, great. But having a blog that simply just accepts content as plain text is a little boring. So you so use another set of Rails features. Um, this is action text we're going to add to get what you see is what you get editing for our new blog. We'll start here by adding um, the action text elements. Um, Rails action text install. We'll add a little bit of uh, JavaScript that we need. It'll add some CSS for the new editor and it'll add a set of migrations for us to upload and store files using active storage. In this example, we're just storing locally. When you deploy to production, you can store on S3 or other cloud storage setups. It also adds an image image processing gems so that we can make variants of the files that we upload so that we can uh, get smaller versions of the images or, or otherwise. So we'll bundle to get that um, image processing gem on there and then we'll run Rails DB migrate to pick up the couple of migrations we have. Now we have to set up the model to say that we're going to use this um, rich text setup and do has rich text content. And then if we jump to the form for that, instead of having a text area, we can add it as a rich text area. Now we just have to restart the server because we added a new gem. And then we can jump over and see what our new posts look like. Um, oh, we left the error in there. Uh, Got to pick that out again. Let's do that. And then we load. Great. Now you see that the content is not just a plain text field. Um, this is rich. We can use rich text. We can do the various forms of markups we have in here, and we can even do file uploads. So file uploads can simply be dragged and dropped into our editor here. It'll upload it in the background via active storage to either local, as we're doing here in development, or with direct upload to cloud storage. But we're just going to do it here, Rails logo. And then we create the post. Great. So now we have a post. It has an image attached. And if we go back to all the posts, we can see um, both of the posts that we've put in there. Let me show you how the JavaScript for that is set up. Um, Rails by default, it uses something called import maps, which allows us to use advanced JavaScript uh, without having Node installed on our system. 
Um, we're simply using the JavaScript as text and serving it through the browser and using ESM to, to deliver that. This is set up in terms of what we can use in our map or in our app as this import map. Um, the default is this stuff up here. Rails ships with Hotwire by default turned on. That means the Turbo framework and the Stimulus framework is already set up and ready to use. And then when we ran the action text install generator, it also added the tricks and action text pins. And as you can see here, the application JS then imports tricks and action text, and that is what makes those available to our application so that we can use it. But what if we wanted to add some other JavaScript from NPM? Um, let's have a look at that. We will add a piece of JavaScript for localizing the um, timestamps that these posts were created on our blog, both localizing and using uh, time ago setups. Um, so we will use the bin stop import map and we will pin local time. It'll fetch that off NPM, uh, figure out uh, which um, URL it should use based off the default CDN that we're using for this JavaScript that is JSPM. I'll show you later how you can also download that, but we're just going to depend on the CDN at this time. So now we've added local time to our import map. Let's see it right here. Now we can also import it and start using it as part of our um, application JS. We'll import local time from local time, and then we'll start that local time. Now we can use this. Have a look at the post um, here. We will pop in a new bit where we can mm, have a um, post it and then have a time tag. And this time tag will generate an HTML time tag, which the local time JavaScript will identify, look at the data local attribute. It says time ago, so it'll convert that uh, UTC time into time ago. And um, that's all done in the, in the browser, which means it's cache safe, which is a, a lovely way to present time. So let's have a look at that. Um, jump here to the browser. Posted 10 minutes ago, posted six minutes ago, three minutes ago. So this is all using um, NPM directly. It does not uh, require node of any kind. Um, does it not require NPM installed on your local machine? This is all running off a API using JSPM, <coughs> uh, the CDN. Uh, but you could also just add these uh, pins to your application yourself, wherever you want them. Um, they can be off your own CDN setup, or it can be off any of the other CDNs that are out there like JS Deliver. But we could also um, download this local time instead of having it as a CDN dependency. Let's do that. Um, we'll download it instead. And as you can see here, it's going to download it to vendor JavaScript local time JS. And when we jump back into See there, we can see that that pin is automatically mapped there. We just get a little comment of which version that we're using. And if we jump over to the browser, it works just the same. Great. So now our little blog has posts with localized uh, times, um, has a way to use um, a tricks editor to use what you see is what you get. But we would also like to add some comments to this because that'll allow us to show the relationship within a domain model between multiple models at once. So we'll go back to the terminal here and use our generator again. Instead of Rails generate, we can also just do Rails G. And instead of a scaffold, we'll do a resource, which adds just a thinner wrapper around the model that we're adding here. We're going to add a comment, and that comment is simply going to have um, a post references which creates a foreign key setup and a dependency in the model that this belongs to the post. And it's also going to have a content that's also just going to be text. As you can see, it creates another um, migration. And we're going to have a look at that. 
quite similar. You see it sets up the reference. It will create a foreign key for that reference. It becomes the post underscore ID, and then it has a text column for the content um, for us to use. So let's run that migration and have a look at the domain model that we've just created. Rails console will find the first post, and that, that post has comments. Um, oh, it doesn't have comments yet because we have not yet connected. Um, as you can see here, the comment model belongs to the post, but we also need to tell the post that the post has many comments. Now, if we pop back into the console here, we can actually just reload in line and voila, updates to the domain model live. There are no comments right now, so let's create the first one. It's going to have content of first comment. There we go. Now we have a post in the system that has comments, but we don't have any way of seeing that in our web UI. So let's add that to the web UI. Jumping back in here and then going to um, the post. We're just going to have it on the show template. On the show template here, we're going to render all the comments. Um, we'll actually do a partial for it. That'll be post slash comments. We'll pass in instant variable of posts. So we just use local variables. Um, then let's do comments here. And I've pre-baked some HTML that we can just pop in. Uh, there we go. So this will render all the comments that belong to this post. This is shorthand for what you see up here. We're going to render the partial of comment slash comment with a collection of posts. So it iterates over those. And then we will also render a new form. So let's create those partials. First, we create the comment one. Uh, and I'm also just going to pop that in. It's just going to be a basic div that has an ID, which we will later use for live updating of stuff. It has the comment content, and we're using that time tag again with um, a time ago to see when the comments were posted. And we're also going to create a um, partial for the new form so that we can create new comments on our post. As you can see here, we use a helper called form with. It uses the model that we pass into it. Actually, we're going to pass in the local variable here um, and the comment, and um, and there we go. And then actually, let's also pop in a little notice on the comment itself or on the post itself, just a counter to show how many comments were uh, posted on that. We use one of those helpers, Puralize, um, Puralize that will. Uh, go one uh, comment, two comments, and you'll see that in the UI in just a, a second here. Although we also actually need to add the comments controller. It starts out as just this empty shell here. In order to be able to create any comments, we need a create action. We're going to set that up um, with some prepeg here. Before any of the actions are loaded, we run a callback called set post that will pluck out the post ID from the URL so that we know which post that these comments are supposed to be created for. It will then take the parameters from the form and their scope by comment. It'll require that, which means that if the comment scope is not present, it'll raise an exemption, exception telling us that. And then it'll only permit a allow list of attributes, in this case, just content, such that you can't sneak anything else in. You can't set a different um, foreign key or, or ID and, and corrupt the system. This is just one of those security benefits that you have in Rails out of the box. Great. Let's have a look and see what that looks like. We are now in post. We'll go to this post. Um, and see, we are missing the uh, route that um, post comment is supposed to look up. And that's because we I forgot to edit the routes file. So the resources generator adds this comments uh, resources, but it's of course at the root. And what we want it is to have it nested such that the comments belong to the post. Great. See that there are zero comments so far, but we have our 
um, form down here. Let's do let's do one comment. We'll create that comment, and there we go. We have our comment added. Can have a quick look at the console for the the log for this. You see here we do started a post against posts slash three slash comments. This is the nested route that we have. Um, here are the parameters. It's using an authenticity uh, token to make sure that we don't have any CSRF um, exploits. And as you can see here, it's even filtered, just it doesn't show up in the log. We also filter other things like passwords and stuff that you shouldn't be putting into your logs. And then you could see the parameters. Um, this was the required scope comment, and it just has one attribute that is going to be the content and what that content actually is. Then here you can see set post is calling um, that ID, the three from up here. It looks it up, says that we have the post, it proceeds, then inserts the comments. And when it's done, it redirects to post number three and that renders everything again. So now we have a blog that has posts and those posts can have comments, but let's add another feature of Rails. Let's add a mailer such that when a new comment it po is posted, the owner of the blog gets a email letting the person know that a new comment has been posted. So we use another generator for a mailer here. Um, and that mailer is going to be called a comments mailer. And it's just going to have one action on it called submitted. Um, you see this generator, of course, does not generate any migrations, just a bunch of files for us to um, play with. So the first thing we're going to edit is the comments mailer. And you can see it's just a stub here. We're going to be passing in the comment that we want to let the owner know about. We're going to assign that to an instant variable such that it's available in the view. We're going to mail that to, let's say, the blog uh, owner at example.com. And we're going to set a subject for this email to be new comment. Then we can edit the templates that go with this comment mailer that forms the content of the email that's going to be sent out. So that's going to be submitted um, HTML. I have one that's pre-baked we can just pop in. And the neat thing here you can see is we're reusing the same partial templates, the comment slash comment template, the HTML template for the HTML part of the email as well. This is how a lot of things in Rails uh, work, that you can use the same templates across things like emails, the first render, live updates. You're never recreating templates more than once. And then, of course, we also have the plain text version of the email where we're not going to use that partial. We're just going to pop it in as plain text. Rails has this new feature, a neat feature where we can actually see what these emails are going to look like. Um, we are going to use one of these previews and it's going to just preview whatever the first comment is. And we can jump to this URL in a browser to see what that looks like. You got a new comment on Hello World. First comment, that's the HTML version. Here's the plain text version. And now we know that the mailer itself works. Let's hook the mailer up to our flow such that when a new comment is created, we will also send out the email. So we have the comments mailer. It has the submitted action. We're going to pass in the comment that is being created in this action. Uh, and then we're going to deliver later. Deliver later will use a asynchronous job queue such that neither the rendering of the HTML for this mailer nor the delivery of the email itself happens in line. It happens asynchronously, much faster response time in the UI. And um, that's pretty neat. So let's um, see if that actually works. We'll jump over to the browser again, jump back to our post and then send a comment via email. We'll create that comment and we can see whether it's been sent by checking the log, scrolling back here and you can see the email is being sent. It's being sent to blog owner. It has that subject of new comment. It's rendering a mime part for the HTML and a mime part for the clear text. And if you look up here, you can see the deliver later is set up as an action mailer delivery job, which is this out of band um, asynchronous setup. In production, we would use a full queuing system, or a rescue or something else like that. Um, in development, it is just happening uh, in line. Great.
now we have a blog that can also send email. Let's make this blog live. And we're going to use the default Hotwire stack, or at least one part of it, the turbo part of it, to make adding comments a live event. Um, and it is surprisingly simple. As you saw before when we looked at the application JS, Hotwire is already configured in a new Rails app. So we can simply start using it. So we're going to start using it by setting up a subscription to a turbo stream on the post um, show action. We're going to use this turbo stream from and then the name of the stream we're going to use is going to be derived from the post. Um, since it has an exclusive stream for the comments that are posted to that. And then when a comment is created, we're going to let it broadcast um, to the post. That will broadcast both uh, creates, updates, and destroys, which we can uh, now demonstrate. So let's jump over to our browser, and then let's actually make another browser such that we can have them side by side and see that this stuff is happening live. Um, okay, let's scroll down here. Is this a live comment? It sure is. It showed up over here as well because via web sockets, we're delivering all these updates that are made to the comments. They're being broadcast, whether they're being invoked from a web UI as here or if they're being invoked from the console um, as well, since it just goes through the Rails domain model. So we could do here, find the post three, and then look at the comments. Uh, we have those comments. We could take a look at the last one, and what will happen if we destroy the last one? Boom, it's gone. And it's gone because when we destroy the last one, a callback is being triggered by that setup of broadcast two that will broadcast this turbo stream element, remove, and the target is comment underscore ID, which matches the DOM ID we had set up for the partial for the individual comment. We can also update here from the console. So if we do a update of the content, uh, content uh, updated from console, you can see that that update is sent out as well. And that update, contrary to the delete update, is actually done asynchronously because we're rendering a template. So that also happens out of band. Um, and there you have it. Creates, updates, and deletes are all broadcast automatically. And of course, you can tweak this and set it up to your heart consent, but uh, simply adding the broadcast to will do it for all the three actions by default when you follow the conventions. Okay, we've created quite a lot of code. Let's have a look and see if we also have some tests. And of course we do because all these generators we've been running have been creating stop testing that actually exercises the app. And if we run those with Rails tests, we'll see a couple of them failing. Uh, we have one failing because of a invalid foreign key, and that happens when we go to destroy the post. Um, then you have comments that depend on that code post now having an invalid foreign key. So we can fix that first by jumping back into the post model. And instead of just saying has many comments, we'll also say that they are dependent and they will be destroyed when we destroy a post. Then let's run the tests again. Now that test is no longer failing. We still have a failing test for the comments mailer because that is of course just generated off um, the defaults that weren't tweaked we'll use um, a fixture here. If you have a look at uh, comments YAML, you'll see we set up fixtures for all models that are generated through the generators such that you can uh, set up a set of fixtures that you can refer to in your, text, in your tests that run very fast. And then I also remember we changed the subject to new comment and then we sent this to the blog owner and it was from example, we're not gonna match on the body right now. Let's go back and run that. Boom, all our tests are passing on our new wonderful blog that does um, what you see is what you get editing, it does comments, it does live comments. Um, and now our application as such is, is done. But what if we wanted to show other people this application? Let's deploy this to production. 
And I'm going to use Heroku to do this because Heroku is nice and simple and easy to use. Um, but where the Rails skeleton by default is started with um, SQLite as the database, uh, Heroku uses Postgres, but thankfully there is a command here, Rails DB system change, where we can change the configuration of our database to use um, Postgres instead. That'll add the Postgres adapter, so we'll have to bundle for that. Um, and then we can add um, everything to Git, because that is how we will push to Heroku. So we'll add everything to Git. We will commit everything that we've added as first here. And then we will create the Heroku setup that we're going to deploy our app to. And once we've done that, we can push our app straight to Heroku, uh, Heroku main. And we're going to get a little error here in just a second that we can correct. Because there is a check here, and you can see this is failing because I'm making this demo on an M1 machine, and Heroku is not running on an ARM64, so we just have to add um, x64 here as our platform for the bundle lock. We'll do that, and then we'll add the um, gem file lock again, commit that, add it the platform, and then we can push again. And now we have deployed our app to Heroku. We've been assigned the mighty Tundra as our URL for this. And um, we can go have a look at that in just a second. We need to do a couple more things. We need to, first of all, migrate our database, which will also set it up. We'll use Heroku run rake uh, db migrate. And then we need to add Redis as an add-on to our Heroku setup because Redis is used by the Turbo setup to send those live updates back and forth. Great, now everything should be setting up. So let's have a look at our live app deployed in production. We can use this one here. And you see the page you're looking for doesn't exist. And that's because we haven't actually set up a root route in our application. So let's do that. If we go back to the routes here, you'll see there's actually a comment just for that purpose. So we'll set it up. So when you go to the root, it'll go straight to the posts index and we will commit that setup. Um, we'll add it and commit it, adding the root route, and then we can push that again to Heroku. Now that's set up, so let's have a look and see if the app works in production. There we go. We have an empty one, of course, because it's a brand new database. This is the first post. Now, the only thing that does not work yet here in production is dragging and dropping files because Heroku um, would require us to set up S3 and you can use that as an exercise for the reader for you to set that up, but it is quite easy to do, just a matter of a little bit of configuration, and then you will also have the direct uploads with drag and drop here. But let's create this um, post, and then let's create the first comment, and check that everything is working here in production. And there you go. There is now one comment posted, so let's do the test and see if we're set up and it works correctly with the turbo back to get the comments from one side to the other. This is the second comment. And it sure does. So now we have the entire application running in production backed by a live setup that uses Redis and all the other goodies. Um, and that's all you need to get going, get started building something real with Ruby on Rails, taking it all the way from hello world to who knows, perhaps maybe one day IPO. Thank you.